uh, for those of you who uh, are members of the na nationwide organization, formerly known as NARP, as you're aware, it's now called the Rail Passengers Association. And for the last five years, the president and CEO is uh, Jim Matthews, and he has graciously accepted our invitation to come and speak to us on this lovely Saturday, Sunday, sunny Saturday in Schenectady. So, welcome to Jim Matthews. Uh, first of all, uh, you all notice, I'm, I do have a confession I have to make to all of you. I'm short. Uh, I blame my parents. I'm going to step away from this because I just can't stand you know, walking behind that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try to go fairly quickly so that there's time for questions. Uh, not only we're going to talk about the value of constructive engagement, Really here to talk about is what it looks like in DC uh, for passenger rail, both politically and legislatively here you know, in the near future. So we'll call it 2020. Um, I like to start with what's called a bottom line up front. That way, all of you who just had your lunch, if you can't get through my presentation, if you have to head out to the men's room or the ladies' room or make a phone call or whatever else it is, I want you to at least have these facts before you go. Um, and, and I'd like to really just hammer this home because all of you have to hammer this message with the folks that you visit with. We have stuck to a consistent message here for the past couple of years and it is that trains deliver value to serve communities six, seven, or even more times the dollars invested in the service. The profit goes to the communities and to the country, not necessarily to Amtrak. The profit is value for the nation. And where we are now, where we were not a few years ago, is that Congress is willing to invest in value. So we're going to stamp out that word subsidies. Everybody stop saying subsidies. These are investments. These are investments. And so, walk away with nothing else, the following phrase should be in your head for every legislator, senator, staffer, mayor, transportation official that you meet. And it should be this. It does not matter if the train makes a profit. It matters who profits from the train. Just say that. Value versus profit, that's an incredibly important idea that we need to get out there and surface for the um, Surface Transportation Bill reauthorization, which is coming up. Um, it's also important as we start to see a bipartisan consensus emerge on the need for a large infrastructure bill. Um, we have been making the most aggressive, credible case for the return on these investments. We're calling it a return on taxpayers' equity. We're trying to get away from this idea that we're putting money into this thing because it's good, because we like it. This is returning value to the taxpayers who have spent the last 50 years investing in it. We've done economic studies here at the, at the association. Um, the staff has, has conducted these. Um, our study on the Southwest Chief, $180 million annual benefit to the three states who would have lost service under the bus institution plan. Uh, service between Chicago and Minneapolis St. Paul, they call it the Baby Builder, which is going to run on the same line. Uh, $47 million annual benefit. Uh, the Empire Builder, end to end, $327 million of benefit to the 10 states served. Uh, we just won in Mobile. I hope you all saw that. A little baby step towards the full restoration of the Gulf Coast, but that's going to be a really important thing. Just that service alone, $170 million to those three states for really $7 million in operating. So let's not talk about subsidies. Let's talk about spending $7 million to make 170 because that's what this is about. And uh, rail passengers, I and my team have been working very, very closely with congressional offices to advance the interests of rail passengers. And the phrase that I like to use is that we're creating an Amtrak that can grow new service without sacrificing long-distance trains. That's the message that we've been delivering to 
Congress. I think Congress has been helping us with this. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But again, this is the, if you have to run off and you don't want to listen to me talk for the rest of the afternoon, please do these three things. Engage with your member of Congress on securing near-term funding for Amtrak and passenger rail. Ask your congressman or your senator, or your congressman, I should say, to sign on to um, Representative Seth Moulton's sign-on letter in the House to support full fund funding for Amtrak. When you call your congressional representative, talk about the things that you would like to see done. When you call your congressional representative, support the Amtrak legislative and grant request. And we're going to talk in some detail about that here in a few minutes. Um, and ask your member of Congress to reject the administration's proposed cuts in the 2021 budget proposal. And this is important, and I'm going to tell you why. I had a lot of folks call me in the office shortly after that and say, why are you getting us all spun up about the president's budget? The president's budgets are always dead in the water when they arrive. We, should, we shouldn't be getting worried about that. You know what? That's complacency. We should get worried about that. The reason why they're dead in the water is because Congress knows they have the power to reject it. And if they don't hear from the folks at home, they start to wonder, well, gee, do these people like that? Maybe I should support this bill. So you have to make your voices heard every single solitary time. If you're coming to Real Nation, and I hope you are, our spring meeting, we're only four weeks away, um, schedule your meetings in Congress now. Please don't wait. This is the, the perfect time to do it. You can go online, on our site, Real Nation 2020, and there's a scheduling tool there to set up your meetings. Please do this. Um, we punch way, way, way above our weight with the Rail Passengers Association, but um, believe me, we do not have a staff of 25 people working in policy like APTA, the American Public Transit Association, some of those folks. We have one person in the DC office who is working hard on policy all the time, and that's Sean. And I help Sean, and Joy Ello helps Sean, but Sean's trying to do this by himself, so make your own appointments and get them in that, that tool. All right, so that's my bottom line message. Everyone who needs to head off to the men's room, ladies, you can go ahead and do that. But, if you're gonna stay, I'd like to share with you a little story. And I'm gonna take us back 380 days ago. Everybody remember this? This was in the Wall Street Journal. It was February 20th, 2019. Reporter Ted Mann wrote this story about Amtrak's trial balloon. It said, we've got to do this short corridor service in the southeast and all these places in the country that really should have train services don't have it. But there's an opportunity cost and we just can't, we're, we're going to have to make other stuff go away to pay for it. I did a three hour interview with Ted Mann for that story. And we were quoted fairly high up in the story, but the, the gist of it was that Amtrak was ready to jettison the this is becoming a Homeric epithet. The money losing long distance trains. February 20th, 2019. So here's what we said on February 20th, 2019, when the day that story came out. I don't know if everybody reads our blog. I hope you do. Because we do try to get a lot of stuff up there for you. But the last paragraph that I wrote, I said that it is clear that Amtrak does not need to be timid in asking Congress to support growth and new services. I've had that conversation with Stephen Gardner for months leading up to this. And his position was, we have to make tough choices. And I said, you know what? You don't. We're in a place now in the Congress where we were not even five years ago. The Congress is willing to support these investments because they see the value of what comes back out. And you need to be bold and you need to ask for the money to start these services without gutting the rest of the service. I had that conversation with Stephen. I had that conversation with Richard Anderson. I had that conversation with Chairman Tony Kosha. And more importantly, Sean and I had that conversation with about 60 congressional offices. We responded with something called the Rail Passengers Blueprint. This is our blueprint for the reauthorization. It had three main ideas. 
sustainable service on the net national network. We want to, to legally enshrine the role of the national network and that, that role that it plays in connecting rural America to the rest of the country. We wanted to use the reauthorization to work with Amtrak to add state-supported services. We want to fix the host operator relationship to solve the on-time performance problem and the shared use problem. And we've got to refleet. We've got to refleet. We have a rolling museum out there right now. And it's absurd that we have to go out on the train and carry our own Velcro to make repairs and duct tape. So this blueprint is what we were shopping around in the Senate and the House, and we shared it with Amtrak. So, let's fast forward to today. This is the Amtrak's growth vision that they just released in their fiscal 21 legislative report and grant request, which is usually shortened in conversation to the ledge and grant. $1.3 billion Amtrak's looking for in national network grants, and that includes almost $5 million for the Southwest Chief track improvements. Remember, that was the fight that they had with the DOT and with everybody else about possibly bustituting in three states. Their, their nut was that there was this problem with the track and they didn't want to spend the money. So that's that's a significant of the money. Northeast quarter grant, 714 million. I've highlighted the corridor development program, $300 million. That, that started as a conversation with us and Stephen Gardner over burgers, in Philadelphia, I said, here's the deal. If you ask for a pot of money to start this service, we can go to Congress and we can sell that. He said, I don't think they'll do it. I said, yes, they will. And right up until about two months ago, it wasn't clear to me that they were going to make that request. And here they've done it. They said, okay, $300 million to start a new service so that we don't have to raid the long distance trains kitty to start this new service. And I know that sounds sensible and reasonable and logical to people in this room, but you know what? In DC, in the present political climate, that was an act of courage. Amtrak was taking a gamble with an aggressive legend grant request like this. And they basically did it because we goaded them into it as advocates. We need to we need to reward them for that. We really do. Uh, fleet plan updates. We've been begging. Fix this stuff. Start buying this stuff. The sellers are cool. I can't wait to ride the new train sets, but you know what? We need equipment throughout the network. So they put a they put a billion dollars into the fleet plan for just long distance equipment alone. They've also gone to Congress and said we need two million more for additional work on the MQ twos and superliners. Diesel locomotive replacement, there's mo money in there for that. And they've set aside uh, $510 million additional fleet for the new corridors. These are things they've asked Congress to do. That's not in the request because it's not within the authorized levels in the FAST Act. So they can't do that without Congress's help. But they've identified it and said, if we were to get some help with this, this is where we would spend the money. So, very aggressive budgetary growth to support a lot of the things that advocates have been arguing about for many, many years that need to be done. But there's even more good stuff. Remember that blueprint I showed you? There's a lot of policy ideas in that blueprint. Amtrak endorsed eight of them in their legend grant request. We've been pushing for a long-distance intercity passenger rail working group. It's basically broker a peace treaty between the class ones and passenger rails so and start really working on on-time performance and figure out what this really, what we can do to, to really solve this problem. The Rail Passenger Fairness Act, Senator Durbin's bill, um, they're supporting that, we're supporting that, we helped to write that. Um, I testified before the Surface Transportation Board two years ago on precision scheduled railroading. Uh, they had three days of shippers coming in and bashing on CSX for their lousy performance on precision scheduled railroading. I was one of many dashers. Uh, but one of the things we did, we, we put in our blueprint was, hey, we need to really study this. This is dramatically changing the way we do railroading in this country. And we need to figure out what that actually means. 
and um, Amtrak has endorsed that. <coughs> um, process improvements for access to host railroads, that's a very diplomatic way of saying, let's figure out how we can start new service and not be told it costs $2 billion to get from the Warlords to Jacksonville. Um, rail airport connections, we're pushing very hard on that. There's unspent money uh, that could be used to connect rail stations to airports. Um, we, as always, are advocating for a passenger rail trust fund. Amtrak has endorsed that. Um, Amtrak has endorsed a passenger freight railroad shared tax credit. That's a new, the, the new thing for them. But we think, you know, if we're going to use the carrot and the stick, let's, let's throw a few carrots in there. And there is some appetite for that. If you look at what's happened in Virginia, one of the things that's happened in Virginia is more carrot than stick. And lo and behold, we've got this tremendous investment taking place in Virginia right now. So, I do want to turn quickly to the infrastructure piece of this, because in D.C. it really is always infrastructure week. Um, there's going to be an infrastructure bill, okay? There is going to be an infrastructure bill. I don't know if it's going to be a Democrat bill, a Republican bill, a combination of them. We don't know which bill it's going to be, because there's competing proposals. But everybody wants to do one. There will be an infrastructure bill. Uh, House Democrats just unveiled a five-year, $760 billion infrastructure framework that includes $55 billion for rail and $105 billion for public transit over a five-year period. That's enormous, and it's necessary. Everybody is looking at at least a trillion-dollar infrastructure plan. Some of them are looking at as high as $2 trillion. Now you can argue about the math. You can argue about how real the money is, depending on how you generate those funds. But the fact is, there is real appetite to do something about infrastructure on both sides. So this is a good opportunity for us. Um, Congressman Tonko is going to be here, I hope. Um, let me tell you, he has been a very strong friend to passenger rail, um, and he co-sponsored that infrastructure bill. It's called the Move Forward Plan. $55 million in rail, $105 million in transit. So, when you see him, thank him, because it's important. And basically all of our work with Congress is important. We've spent a lot of time in recent years uh, investing in our relationship with Congress. We spend more time there, we work more closely with the staffs. The mantra that I gave the staff when I arrived five years ago was, be a partner, not a problem. And in the current legislative session, here are the folks that we're working with. And these are folks that we have either written language for, or written bills for, or both. House Transportation and Infrastructure staff, plus the Senate Congress staff, we're working on fast act reauthorization, of course, working on the food and beverage problem, on time performance, Amtrak investment, uh, working with Representative Cohen's office on food and beverage. Did anybody, how many of you guys saw me testify in November for House TNI? A handful of you. Do you remember how angry Representative Cohen was about the food and beverage thing? Yeah. He stayed angry. Just so you know, that wasn't just for TV. He stayed angry. And he asked our, our office to help. Uh, Representatives Lamb and Heck, along with um, uh, Senator Blumenthal, the Amtrak forced ticket arbitration. That's a big deal. We're working. You don't know what that is? The question was, what is it? No, I honestly. When you book a ticket, there's a box that you have to check now that says, I agree to these terms and conditions before you can pay for your ticket. You know what those are? It says you can't sue if anything bad happens. Now they tried to do that in the airlines, they made it illegal. But it's not illegal for Amtrak. So, we work on that. Um, I was just up in New Hampshire uh, two weeks ago uh, with Representative Custer on a very wonky bill to reform the RIFT program. The, uh, this is a loan program. It's $36 billion of loan authority. And it's mostly never used. And the reason it's mostly never used is because it's so hard to get to it. It's padlocked behind so much bureaucracy and red tape that you can't get to it. 
and it's been sitting there, and it could be used. So she wrote a very technical bill with help from the American Short Line Railroad Association and from us to try to take the padlocks off that RIF program so that we can actually use it. She should get credit for that because congressmen usually only get credit for things that get them on TV. That's a very wonky bill. They're not going to get on TV with a RIF loan program, but it's going to be really vital for advancing some of these projects that we want to see go forward. Um, Congressman Bolton, uh, North South Rail Lake, plus uh, the Simon letter on full Amtrak funding. Um, you should know he has been a member of our association for 15 years. Representative has. Um, Representative Lipinski, again, uh, on time performance, uh, in and out of Chicago is a big deal. Uh, work on the Fast Act reauthorization. Uh, Senator Durbin on the uh, on time performance bill. With Senator Worker, we've worked very, very hard on the Gulf Coast restoration. Um, we provided language to Senator Daines and Senator uh, Shelley Moore Capito uh, on station agents. Um, worked with Senator Markey on uh, helping to write a bill on passenger rail corridor grants and grade crossing safety. Uh, we are in a place where we've discovered we're much more effective if we're alongside the staff, helping them, rather than reacting after they've written the bill. So we've been working very hard on that. And I point that out because if you remember the title of the talk, Constructive Engagement, we've gotten a lot of this done, and I didn't have to buy a bill for it saying that we should fire Richard Anderson. <laughs> so, all of this is taking place against the backdrop of the White House saying we should essentially dismantle Amtrak. And I asked early on that everyone please respond to this. You know what? Folks did. Within one week, we had just about hit the entire Congress. 423 representatives and 96 senators were contacted by our members. I'm very, very proud of that. Our members really did answer the call when we rang the bell. So, the outlook for the next few months and what your game plan should be as advocates. We were talking, the mayor and I were talking at lunch about this. Um, we're not going to have a lot of time to reauthorize the FAST Act. Um, the first three items on that, you'll notice I've got check, check marks next to the first two. There's actually I should have put a check mark next to the TNI real title hearing as well. So we passed the appropriations deadline, we passed Super Tuesday. Uh, there was a, a House TNI hearing. The Amtrak testified to unveil their alleged grant request. Uh, the next thing coming up is in July, the party conventions, July and August. The FAST Act expires on September 30th. So that means. <coughs> Congress is going to close up by June. They're going to flip off the lights and they're going to go home and campaign. Between the presidential elections and the congressional elections, they're going to stop working. So realistically, we've got until the end of June to get some serious movement on reauthorization. There's two must-pass bills. There's got to be a fiscal 21 budget or a continuing resolution to avoid a government shutdown. We've all heard this before. We have, we've, we've lived with this now for a decade. But the other thing that's got to happen is there has to be either a replacement, an actual reauthorization, or some kind of short-term extension for the FAST Act. Because if you don't do that, you lose the legal authority to collect gas tax revenue for highways and transit. And that is a great big fat money spigot that people are not going to want to shut off. So something has got to get done. A CR, a short term extension, if we don't get an honest thing on this fast act reauthorization. I don't think we're going to get a fast act reauthorization. There's just not enough time. But we have to lay out a set of principles. This says I'm almost out of time. So have a few minutes. So have a few minutes, okay. Uh, We've got to lay out a clear set of principles, like we talked about at the beginning, right? It's not about whether the train makes a profit, it's about who profits from the 
trains existence. Congress is willing to invest in this value. Trains produce value. $327 million for the Empire Building, $170 million for this Gulf Coast restoration, $47 million for the baby builder between Chicago and Minneapolis. Whatever drafts of this bill are produced by the House and the Senate, and they are drafting now, will it get passed in time for the session? I don't think so. Are there drafts? You betcha. That's what we're helping to write right now. Those drafts are going to influence the final product. So this messaging has to get injected into these drafts now. I'm going to skip over this because, frankly, all the numbers are higher. The Overton window has shifted on this table. This was, a, this was considered a really ambitious table a year ago. And now we're seeing numbers like $11 million a year. So I'm going to really skip over this table. But suffice it to say that we have a window to operate. We just have to go quick. So I'm going to hit this again. You need to call your congressman. You need to tell them that you care about this. You need to tell them that Amtrak's legislative and grant request should be supported. You need to tell them to reject the White House's proposed Amtrak cuts. If you need materials for your meetings, either here, in your district offices, with your mayor, with your uh, transportation folks, whoever you want to sit down with, our briefing materials are available at railpassengers.org slash railnation2020. We've made it easy. And then please consider scheduling your meetings if you're coming to Rail Nation at the end of the month. Schedule your meetings now. We have a fairly ambitious target for trying to hit as many congressional offices as we can, and we need your help to do that. So I've tried to go through this fairly quickly, so if there's time for questions, but I know we're a little late, whatever you want to do. No, we are. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. We have plenty of time at the end, and we're on schedule. So okay. We have 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Uh, 10 minutes, Tom? Andy. <laughs> Okay. So, if folks couldn't hear, I'll repeat the question. Um, it was in the newsletter yesterday. Bill, Bill Flynn's appointment as the new CEO of Amtrak. Um, what did that? How did that affect us? And what do we think of that? Okay. Um, well, we put a, uh, We found out early in the week. We put out a press release uh, where we essentially said that we've had good relationships all along for years and years and years and years with five or six CEOs. And we expect this to continue. That was largely aspirational. But yes, uh, I got a, a note from um, the Amtrak chairman, Tony Kosha, um, asking about my availability to sit down and, and meet with Flynn. Um, so we're trying to work that out. Uh, Everything I hear about him is that he is a kind of, if you went, if you called Hollywood Central Casting and said, I need a CEO, that's what you'd get. Not essentially a real big vision guy necessarily, but a kind of hard-nosed execution of the plan kind of guy. Yeah. Um, so I see our biggest challenges with him, really making sure he understands a, the unique selling proposition that Amtrak has. Okay, and how many of you guys have taken business classes in your life? Okay, so we know what a unique selling proposition is, right? This is not like magic government policy type stuff. This is basic business, whether you run a barber shop or, or a hardware shop or anything else, your unique selling proposition. And if you turn Amtrak into Spirit Airlines, just going slower, well, that's probably not the right answer, is it? Um, and again, one of the reasons we've invested in these economic benefit studies is to show the case for passenger rail. So the only, the only other thing we're going to have to remind him of is the fact that Amtrak is not required to make a profit. It's not required by law to make a profit, 
and it's not required by policy to make a profit. They've just decided that this is something they want to do. I get it. I mean, by all means, don't waste money. By all means, run a tight ship. My goodness, of course. But the idea that we're going to start serving Swanson's microwave meals in order to make that number, well, that's insane. So we'll work on that. And Congress is probably going to make sure, based on the conversation we've had with at least three other congressmen, um, the food thing has gotten a lot of attention. So. Um, yes, um, I think RPA's work is notable, so there's no question. Um, getting home here in terms of NESCA and what we want, which is a better service in New York State. That's something I've spoken to you about briefly, and just wanted to you know, throw it out there. And that I think one of the challenges of improving our service is the framework of state supported service on the pre of two oh nine. Yes. And there was a third testimony at the CNI hearing on November thirteenth from Stacy Mortensen, the head of the San Joaquin service. She outlined under her testimony what was called a tale of two services. All of the issues that have to do with pre of two oh nine. In New York, you know, we subsidize the cost we're a customer of $44 million. Mm -hmm. And for that, we have a mediocre service. I think all of us in this room want a better service in New York State. And I think we're frustrated that the framework doesn't allow that to happen, partly because of the fact that there's a lot of things within 209 in terms of transparency, accountability, etc. Stacey Mortensen outlined it in detail. What is RPA's position? Amtrak is asking for an additional $300 million to expand essentially state supported service. What will be the framework for the accountability and transparency of you know, making it so that it works for the states as well as it works for Amtrak? So, a couple of things. First of all, our position on Section 209 has always been that it needs to be fixed, that it was a kind of poison pill that was put into Amtrak's life. And the idea was that, well, we'll revisit it next legislative session. And that never happened. Um, so we, we think that Section 209 basically is broken and needs to be redone. In fact, you know, Steve Gardner played a role in writing that when he was in the Senate, in the Senate staff. So I remember sitting down with him a couple months ago as we were talking about this, you know, corridor stuff. And I said, so Stephen, are you starting to regret having written 209? And he just kept eating his burger. <laughs> um, but no, it needs to be fixed. Um, the, the $300 million is really earmarked for corridors, which may or may not be 750 miles. Right? So there's a possibility that we could get into a place where it doesn't count. Um, the main idea behind that $300 million was to make it so that you can start talking about these, these kinds of services without throwing the Southwest Chief overboard or the Sunset overboard or one of those. Um, transparency has got to happen. We've, we're including that in our reauthorization conversations with, with all the folks that we talked to, whether it's on the Senate or the House side. Um, we've made it clear that Congress has a role in ensuring that states actually know what they're being charged for, why they're being charged for it, and, and to give them some leverage as customers. Because particularly with the way it is right now, on who gets access to class one railroads and who can actually run services. We just saw we saw this in Indiana, right? You kind of don't have a choice. And this is certainly not a free market in the traditional sense. You're gonna go to Amtrak. And so we have to ensure that there's transparency. Um, most of the folks in Congress get that. Um, Part of what's going to be helpful in that regard is for states to get more demanding. Um, and some states are very demanding and say, look, I'm not going to take that answer. I want a real answer. Other states are like, well, that's what they told me. So we've got to work on that too. So we've got to push the, we've got to push the states as well on that. But A, you're right. B, we're working on it. C, we need help from the states. Yes. Go back to uh, Jack. Uh, 
I think all of them are effective depending on, on what you're doing. I think the thing that, that makes the difference between effective and ineffective is not what method you choose, it's frequency. If, it, if it's an annual ritual for you, okay, you need to be a resource. The people in your district office need to know you by face. And they need to know that you actually know what you're talking about. So, when they see you, it's not, it's, oh, I've been waiting for you. I've got this thing, and I've got to work on this. Um, so it's frequency. Sometimes it's email, sometimes it's a phone call, sometimes it's to visit the district office. And, and really, your member is important, but the staff is, in some ways, even more important. Because it's the staff that supports the member. Um, so, all of those things are important, and it's really more about how often you do that, rather than maybe sometimes in an email, maybe it's a letter. It, it all kind of depends on what the situation is. They're all valid. Just keep doing it is more important. Now we're going to chat. So that's an interesting thing, and I want to talk about that for a second. I know we're starting to run out of time, but it's, this is a really important one. Um, Sean and I sat down with the House Select Committee uh, on the climate crisis, and they reached out to us. They asked us to come visit them and talk about pieces of legislation that could be revived that have already been out there, and then what additional policy prescriptions we would have for them. And one of the very first things we told them was electrification. That if you really are serious, you're really serious, that's what you gotta do. And it's not impossible, it's not crazy, it's not pie in the sky, it's done lots of other places, and if we're willing to spend the money on the infrastructure, that's, that's the long-term answer. That's even a medium-term answer. Um, the present administration is hostile to that, um, not surprisingly, I mean, you saw what they did in California uh, about blocking the, the money that would have been spent to electrify that corridor because it might actually help the high speed rail project too, and we can't have that. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's, that's in the way, but you're absolutely right, and um, we have we've certainly pushed for that um, with the offices that are advancing that cause. So that's mostly on the House side, less so on the Senate side. Um, just because that's where the appetite is good. One more question. I think so. Which one? <laughs> Steve had his hand up before. Okay, Steve. Okay, uh, Jim, I noticed that in your presentation and in your written materials, you didn't say one word about what I think is our biggest infrastructure problem, which is Hudson River Tunnel, Portal Bridge, the whole package that we call the mm -hmm. What has uh, our organization done to promote that? And how does that fit into our presentation that I The short answer is every single day we have a gateway conversation of some kind. Um, this is one of those things where it deserves its own. It's kind of hard to, to, to do gateway justice in a large, sort of broad presentation about reauthorization and fast act and infrastructure and everything else. Um, but we have pushed very, very hard. The obstacle is DOT, period. And Elaine Chow, period. Um, I, I, I am a member of the National Advisory Committee on Travel and Tourism Infrastructure. Secretary Fox appointed me to that just before the Obama administration left town. Surprisingly, Secretary Chow reappointed me to the NAC team. Um, we are in the midst of finalizing a draft of a report to the Secretary's office on investments that need to be made throughout the country on all surface transportation, not just rail, um, as well as air. And we devote a significant amount of time in the report to Gateway. 
Now, if you think about it, she has been about as anti-gateway as it gets. And her committee, us, we're going to produce a report with a chapter in it that says you got to do gateway. So we're going to stick it right under her nose and say this is important. The, the obstacle really is not Congress in this case. Everyone really does recognize the need to get this done. There is just a, a, a it's an almost religious objection uh, within the, the present DOT. You know, there's a sense that, and you'll hear this argument all the time, it's a local project, it's their problem. Well, no, it's actually 20% of the country's GDP flows through that, that section of rail. So, let's be real. That's right. Okay. So, it's a DOT thing, and that's, that's really where our efforts are focused. Reauthorization is not a great vehicle for advancing that. Thank you, Jim.